Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eric Rossborough. I am associate librarian and senior cataloger at the McCracken Research Library, and I would like to welcome you to the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. I'm very happy to see all your lovely faces here. Very much thank you for coming out for this terrific presentation. As part of the McCracken Library, I'm very proud to present, be presenting uh, Bob Richard, who is going to be talking today about ranching in the Wapiti Valley. Because I'm relatively new here and I was looking through his slides, a lot of the ranches on his slides I haven't even heard of, so I stand to learn something too. Anyway, Bob, you may know, was born on the Frost and Richard Ranch. He started working as a hunting guide at 11, 11 or 12. He started working as a cowboy at 10. He later was a horse, dr horseback uh, park ranger in Yellowstone and later served as a Marine Corps pilot amongst other of his exploits. He was a school administrator, a swim coach, a rancher, and an author who's written about seven books. How many books? A, few, a number of books which will be for sale after up in the bookstore. So you should come upstairs, buy a book, get it signed, and you'll get a chance to meet the man. Anyway, without further ado, I give you Bob Richard. Now I have to live up to that, right? You know, the library had a group of uh, people come down and he, they called them the legends. And uh, you sat at a table and people went around and visited. And I said, I'm not a legend, I'm not dead yet. But uh, anyway, it's always fun. And today is especially nice for me because I look out and I know most of you. And uh, we have interchanged many stories and other things and I hope I don't put too many of you asleep today. Several of my guides are here that worked with me guiding in Yellowstone in the Cody country. Uh, I have been blessed to help record some of the history that I learned from my granddad and my dad and my uncles. And I want to thank uh, the museum and Eric and Mac Frost works here and has been very helpful in help, helping me put these presentations together. And I've told him that when I'm gone and become a legend, he's going to have to do these talks. But anyway, thank you for coming, and we'll get started. Uh, and afterwards, uh, if you have questions or if you want to interrupt me, I'll try and take your questions. But I think we live in one of the greatest places on earth and one of the safest. And I cherish that and I cherish the people that live here. And those that have moved in and joined us, they too have learned to live here and live with us as we do. My granddad says there's no such a thing as a native. He said even the Native Americans immigrated to Cody. Always keep that in mind when you see that sign that says native, okay? We're going to be talking about the North Fork, uh, and I'm going to spend a little more time on the Rhodes Ranch, the Kless Ranch, and the Mooncrest, which uh, are located on Rattlesnake Creek. That's where I spent a lot of my time growing up, and I was also partners on the Rhodes Ranch for a period of time, and an uncle, uh, Willard Rhodes, and I were trying to work out an agreement that would uh, not have a lot of problems and it. We never got it worked out and I said, then I don't belong on the ranch. And thank goodness I went on and started doing tours and I wasn't up all night calving and doing other things that took 24 hours a day to do, but I still miss. And my wife, uh, who was a nurse, loved being a cow nurse. But anyway, we'll continue on. I've gotten a lot of help uh, and information from Dad's collection, 
my collection, the library, research library has been most helpful. And the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, everybody here has helped me. Uh, and they put a table out front upstairs uh, at the store uh, for me to sign books. And uh, if you want them, they have them displayed there for you. Uh, we have a Ned Frost collection and the Frost family, along with the Richard family, have all kinds of photographs. Ned Frost was a wonderful photographer. He got my dad started in photography, but the influence of Ned's way of taking pictures as an artist, my dad's picking up on that and from a couple of other Western photographers. And once in a while I see something that I have done that looks very much like some of those other photographers. And Park County Archives has always been helpful in finding material and helping me verify facts. And I'll try to keep to the facts today, although somebody said I tell good stories too. This is an aerial photograph. And this is looking from about uh, 10,000, 12,000 feet in Dad's aircraft, and he was taking the photograph back in the early 50s. And you're looking to the east, and what a change over today. This we slipped in this morning on the left is, and the, this map is one full map that uh, was done, and Bob Coe owns this map, and it shows the North Fork. It's also in my book showing you how to find these places the Cody D. Yellowstone book with all the rock formations, that type thing, and uh, shows some of the ranches and all the guest ranches on the North Fork. Here's two of the family members, Ned Frost, photographed with a cub black bear on his shoulder. I have all kinds of bear photographs including my dad down on the corner by the Irma across the street with three cub bears on a rope and entertaining the tourists. And on the right is Aunt Mary, or Mary Frost, Ned's wife. She also was my grandmother's sister, and she was a nurse from Chicago. And uh, my grandmother, uh, Aunt Mary, and then we had four or five other children that moved out from Chicago and so we had the whole family and their parents moved out here. This is Fred Richard, my granddad, and Margaret Richard. Uh, she was a Hughes, Mary's sister. And think about it, uh, my grandmother married granddad in New Year's Eve in uh, Chicago in 1908 came out here and Ned and Fred were trapping coyotes, wolves, and other animals. And these two city girls, educated, had to live with these rascals that were skinning all kinds of critters and stretching their hides. And they lived the first winter in 1910. And by that time, Ned had married Mary, and they'd had a child. Dad was a year and a half old, or two. And they lived in Clark all winter. And let me tell you, with the wind and the snow, and I have all the photographs of these women. Grandmother and my granddad lived in a tent. And Aunt Mary and Uncle Ned uh, lived in the uh, cabin, a homestead cabin, and there was probably a foot of dirt as a floor. They didn't know till a 
flood that spring on Bennett Creek washed the floor out and there was a wooden floor underneath the dirt. Uh, at the end of the spring, the two girls made it very clear to these two hardy old men, or young men, we're not spending another winter in Clark. And they sold the furs, they sold uh, and got the bounties and what have you. And it was enough to buy a ranch on the North Fork. Uh, most of you probably know it as Copper Leaf or as uh, uh, Sky Tell, but that's the old Frost and Richard Ranch. And I'll get into more history as we go along. But Frost and Richard had tours to Yellowstone, hunting trips. They were very busy. They took up to 150 guests at a time to Yellowstone Park for 18 days. And uh, they were self-contained, had a cook, a cook wagon. They had a group of wagons that uh, carried the supplies and those that carried people. They owned 600 head of horses. And when they were through in the fall, they turned them loose. And then the next spring, they had all the North Fork to find them and gather them for the next summer. And they started doing this in, uh, through about 1915, 1916. And then they let the cars into the park and that stopped the 18 day wagon trips. On the left is Fred Richard. And the next is Andy Martin. The next is Dwight Hollister. And there's a Hollister Ranch just east of the Frost and Richard Ranch. And the man on the right is Hardy Shull. They all ranched, they all had livestock. But Hardy Shull's real note to fame was he was the best moonshiner in the county and made good whiskey. And when the sheriff would call my granddad and said, I've had some complaints, I've got to go look for stills. And sheriff Blackburn would say, I need to rent a horse and Fred, you need to go with me. And uh, he'd drive up and they would ride around the Wapata Valley and get back. And when he got in his car, he had four or five quarts of the best moonshine to go home with. I found them. I found three of Hardy's, and uh, there was Jack Spicer that had still south of the highway, and he made good whiskey and took it to Billings and sold it, and they sold it in ice cream parlors in quart jars. But uh, Jack Spicer was shot by one of his nephews because Jack had pulled a gun and shot his nephew and wounded him, and. Uh, he thought that the nephew, Arliss, was uh, messing with his wife. And that's what started the shooting. And uh, Arliss ended up in the hospital, and of course Jack ended up in the mortuary. And after Arliss went back to North Carolina and became a minister, uh, lo and behold, uh, Jake and uh, Lonnie Royal got married. So maybe there was something to it, who knows. But Jake and Lonnie lived on the North Fork for years. Lonnie Royal was 94 when his brother Arliss came back out uh, and spent two weeks here. And I had the opportunity to go out and join them and have coffee and hear some of their stories, but I won't spend the time today. This is Will Richard. This is a brother to Fred Richard, and he had a ranch property and a fur farm on Green Creek. And uh, he didn't like, they called it uh, Arctic fur, and uh, what it was was skunks. And they raised skunks, and he had a partner, and Uncle Will did not like 
to have to clean these skunks and skin them out and what have you. So he sold his interest to his partner and he moved to town and got in the taxidermy business. Uh, not sure that improved things much, but he was a great artist, uh, learned under W.R. Lee, and he also was an artist making mounts. This is a home that you still see on the North Fork. It's a White House, it's a Sears and Roebuck catalog home, and uh, it was built in about 1906, and uh, it's prefabbed, brought in by wagon, it's still standing, and it's still owned by the Sour Wines. They moved here in 45, but uh, Joe Kelly built it for his wife who was in a hospital in Nebraska, and he got it finished, was headed to pick her up, and she passed away in Nebraska. But lots of history, and the furniture in the house is old, heavy furniture, and if you ever get a chance to visit and go through it, it's worth uh, a visit. This is a photograph, and I'll try to remember the names. On the left is Oscar Montgomery, Ethel Montgomery, who was a great pie maker and cook, and she also worked at the Bradford Ranch, which was a part of the Frost and Richard Ranch at one time, and Grandmother Upton. And then the big tall man was Fred Morris, who had a dude ranch just west of Trout Creek, and his wife Mary, and they had a son, Leonard. Fred Morris built ships on the East Coast in World War I, troop ships, and in World War II, he was out above Seattle building ships and turned the ranch over to his son. But it's the first ranch on the North Fork that had a swimming pool. And it's, you probably know it as a broken H. Movies were made on the North Fork in the 20s, and uh, several movie makers, because of the Bradfords who were uh, into making movies in Hollywood. And they came out and stayed at the Frost and Richard Ranch, and then they bought uh, about, oh, 160 acres down along the river and next to Green Creek. And they made several movies, including the first Virginian on Cottonwood Creek on your way to Belfry. But that is a group of Crow Indians attacking something, uh, and this movie was being made at the Morris Ranch. But uh, the Valley has been very active in old movies. This is the petroglyphs, uh, and that's my wife pointing to them. If you go up Green Creek, there's some sandstone on the left-hand side, and to the best of my analysis, the Indians carved the petroglyphs back when they first got horses in this country. But uh, they're very easy to find and easy to see, but it's one of the highlights that I share with people today. This is looking across the way at Big Creek and the mountains behind part of Jim Mountain and others. Uh, a lot of history there and a great place to hunt. I guided for Chew Frost uh, and took Hunter's mountain sheep hunting. We got some big heads there. Chew also trapped mountain sheep for the Wyoming Game and Fish in the 30s. And I also worked in Jackson and published uh, information on the mountain sheep. But those they trapped they took down to uh, I, where I-70 is today and goes through the Eisenhower Tunnel, and they transplanted mountain sheep down there that are still there today. Does anybody recognize what these are? These are lilacs, and they're up at Clearwater, and that's where the CCCs were, and they had a camp with several buildings and they 
put together trails, they helped build the roads, they helped build bridges, and they planted uh, this, and they also planted yellow roses. And they're still growing without water. I go up and take a slip of the uh, lilacs, and I put them in my yard about every other year to add to what we have. But they're beautiful, and if you go up, oh, about the 10th of June, they're in bloom. How many of you have seen them? Great. This is a, we're lucky to have the east entrance to Yellowstone. It helps bring tourists to Cody. That's a photograph that I took one morning with some guests of a mama bear and her cub coming in. And every employee, when he retires from Yellowstone with the Park Service, gets that print. And the Zantara employees also get that print. And it's been my best selling photograph. But uh, it also talks about what's at the end of the North Fork. This is an aerial looking up Rattlesnake Creek. When I look in the computer, I don't get the clarity that I get up here. But you're looking at uh, Rattlesnake Creek where the Rhodes Ranch was, and at one time Willard Rhodes and Elaine owned the whole valley. But Willard, when he bought the Mooncrest Ranch, He'd paid $20,000 for it, and he says, I can't pay all that interest. And he kept it three years. We put up hay up there and, and uh, enjoyed having it, but he just said that's costing him too much, and he turned around and sold it. And uh, it changed hands a couple of times and uh, went on to become part of today's Mooncrest Ranch which encompasses the whole valley again and owned by Bob Modell. The DND Ranch was started back in the early 20s and Charles Rhodes, Willard's father, was a dentist in town and also uh, when he retired, sold it to a Dr. Raymond Howe uh, that was a dentist here for years and years and years. But anyway, the DD, and we had a double D brand also, but uh, that's where the brand came from. This is Charles Rhodes and his family in the early 20s at the ranch house that was there uh, back in the 20s. This is a shot from the hillside looking at what the ranch was. This building was a schoolhouse. It's now out at Trail Town. That house was torn down and Willard built a new house in 1940. Small barn that became our saddle house. And I'll show you more changes as we go along. This is Willard Rhodes and Elaine when they got married in 1935. Willard's brother Howard, who lived in Oregon, and my mother Rhea. Rhea and Elaine were sisters. This is coming down to cut hay and put hay up in our lower fields. Looking, this is me on this Ford tractor pulling a rake. And Willard on the next tractor, where we had a sidebar sickle prior to about 1948, we used horses and uh, Everything was horse-drawn. We have a baler, and then we built a uh, deal to hook onto this truck so we could uh, put
put hay up and stack hay as high as 36 bales high. And why did we do that? We thought that it was less stack yards and uh, the game and fish provided us with the fences around it. The only problem was when a bull elk got to it, he'd put his antlers in it and tear the fence down and down came our haystacks. But we learned. This is my cousin, same age as I am, Jody, driving our first Jeep and pulling a uh, side delivery rake. And we tended to drive it too fast and Willard was always having to re-weld it at night. And we got several lectures about how to drive slowly or slower. But any rancher will know that he works all day with his livestock and irrigating and then at night you repair the equipment. Jody and I snuck off one day because the hay was drying and we caught lots and lots of trout in the creek up by Mooncrest and we brought them down and we had a big feast but there's probably 40 trout that we caught and so we invited the neighbors and we brought them to show everybody and spread them out on the Jeep. One of the jobs on the ranch that took lots of time is we ran 500 head of cattle and we calved in February and uh, at night Willard or I, when I was growing up, would go out every two hours and check for newborn calves. And when we found a calf, we would load it in a trailer or a skid and take it to the barn, put it into a stall, uh, about 12 by 12, with the mother and make sure that it got that first milk and got started and got warmed up. If we found a calf that had gotten too cold, we would carry him into the house and down by the coal stove and warmed him up. When June and I were back there, she used an electric blanket. She said it was better. But anyway, it, <laughs> it worked. This is during the day. We cabbed right out in front of the house. Uh, this is a skid right here, and the calf's inside. And we take them through the barn and then put them in the stalls there. We had hay over here. And this tree, when I was about seven, I planted. And it's still there, but it's really big now. This is a calf uh, that has a skin of another calf on it. And he's being grafted to the original mother cow that lost the calf. And when we had twins, we tried to take and graft it to the cows that lost a baby. And we'd leave that skin tied on with uh, baling string for three or four days and she got the smell of her own calf and then accepted the calf. We ear tagged every calf. When it was born, one of the first things we did was to uh, weigh the calf and then when we shipped the steers we weighed them again and we also weighed the heifers those that we kept or shipped and then we gave a star or up to three stars for the fastest gaining calf and so we figured out an average daily gain from the day it was born till we shipped and we didn't look at the confirmation we looked at what cows produce the most milk. We also put a brand on our calves and we earmarked them. And uh, even today, uh, there is rustling that goes on uh, in Wyoming. This is a uh, hay barn that we built and put the baled hay in and all the pipe we got from Oregon Basin. 
and we did a lot of welding, but uh, it was solid. And underneath that hay, we kept a space for the uh, calves when it was bad out. They could crawl under and stay fairly warm. Here the feed is getting down and uh, they're about to go out on the east pasture to get their first green grass in May. A mother and calf, we raised Herefords. We had pet deer, we had pet all kinds of animals. I had a pet bobcat. The pet bobcat was a handful. I picked him up, he wasn't any bigger than my fist. He was all mud in the trail, and I stuck him in my pocket. Forgot about him. I'd ridden most of the day. I was cold, got home, hung my jacket up at the back, inside the back door, and I heard this big yow. Well, I just stuck my hand in there, and he got a hold of my skin, and out he came. And I was trying to let loose of him. That didn't work. So I took him up in the kitchen and we got his jaws pulled apart. And he was on the counter. And then I called Doc English, who was our vet. I says, what do we feed this thing? And he gave me a formula and I raised this bobcat. And he became like a dog. He slept on the end of my bed. He growled at anybody that opened the door in the bedroom. He killed the dogs. And granddad said, that's it, he's out of here. And I saved him and he didn't kill him. And then when I was out of high school and getting ready to go to college, and I was, he says, take the damn cat with you. Well, I couldn't do that. And I ended up taking him up to a petting zoo in uh, uh, Red Lodge. And I went back the next summer and saw him and he remembered me but I couldn't go back again, it was just too hard. But, uh, and the only problem with having a pet bobcat is he would follow me like a dog when we were working cattle, and as long as I was on the right horse, I was fine. But when the cat got tired, it ran up on the edge of the hill on the side and then jumped in front of me on my saddle. And as long as the right horse, I was fine. Otherwise, I was down on the ground cussing the cat and the horse. And, but anyway, I learned to be more careful. What's the name of the bobcat? Bob? Thank you, Mac. I'm sure that would have been a good name. I called him Cat. <laughs> uh, here's a photograph. We were caking the bulls. We caked not only the bulls, but the cattle, and we fed them protein cake. Uh, because we didn't feed them any hay till after the 1st of January. And uh, that's me on the left, Jody in the center, and Burl Gale Churchill, who is a farmer uh, with her husband Winston in Powell. This is feeding cattle going up uh, Rattlesnake Creek. Feeding cattle out on the west field west of the house. Uh, that was before we had a baler, but we'd gotten our first Jeep in 1947. And we were the second people in this country to get a Jeep. Chu Frost came home from the Army and bought one at Fort Carson and brought it home with him. And Willard took one look at that and he says, we've got to have one. That's got four-wheel drive. And uh, we wore out about four Jeeps in the next few years. This is the haystack that's 36 bales high. And uh, we had the conveyor belt attached to that old Chevy truck and the winch that turned over and, and turned the conveyor on. And we put that hay up and we wasted our time, thanks to the elk. But that's up at the Mooncrest Ranch. This is feeding out on the west field there at the lower ranch. This is Elaine in the uh, 30s and she was learning to shoot a 22 woodsman and she was raised on a ranch out of Byron uh, in a family of nine children. 
but she knew cattle, she knew livestock. Willard had been educated and trained as an accountant, but they made a good couple to raise cattle and uh, make it work. And Jody and I, as we grew up, we were told to go do this or do that or go check and see how much grass is on uh, one pasture or another, but they never told us how to do it. And so we always had to figure out through trial and error what we were supposed to do. And sometimes we got in trouble and sometimes we didn't, but we learned. Elaine had been selected as the outstanding ranch woman in Park County and was recognized of her involvement with the uh, Park County Cowbells and involved with uh, ranching overall. This is today's ranch house. You'll notice the uh, schoolhouse is gone. It's at Trail Town. This was a bunkhouse. We built the garage, and this house was built in 1940. This is still where they calve their calves. This is taken after uh, I was still a park ranger in Yellowstone. My mother, myself, Jody, Willard, Elaine, and their son Howard. And that was taken in about 1958. This is when I came back from running a school district in California in the foothills of uh, Madera County. And uh, Willard was in the state legislature and I had the ranch to myself. I really enjoyed doing it, but the hours were long and we couldn't come to a good agreement. So uh, June and I went on to other endeavors. During that time, she also was the head of the Cody Hospital Emergency Room. This was a stud horse that I had at the ranch at the time, called him Tom. And he produced a lot of young colts that uh, my boys got to break and that type of thing. This is going up Rattlesnake Creek Road. Bob has identified these things so that uh, Bob Modell has. And so you know where you're going. It's private uh, property and you have to have permission to go into the ranch. Uh, this is the George Kless place. George Kless was the middle neighbor. His wife was an invalid in a wheelchair. And in his spare time, he built five cabins. And this was his biggest guest cabin. And uh, lots of problems between George and my Uncle Willard over water. We had the first water rights. George needed water. And he would, as Willard would say, steal it at night. And at the age of 10, I went up with my uncle uh, to correct the situation. And Willard and George got into it. And George swung his... Uh, irrigating shovel and hit my uncle across the forehead, opened his head up, knocked him out, and then looked at me and says, I guess you better load him in the pickup and take him to the hospital. And head wounds, of course, were bleeding quite badly. And uh, I took off my t-shirt and wrapped it around his head. And George helped me load him in the truck, drove down to the ranch, my aunt wasn't there, so here I am, 10 years old, driving the pickup, and went down the damn hill and got to the hospital. Well, Willard woke up before I got to the hospital, and he was going to go back and kill that SOB. And uh, anyway, got him in the hospital, called my mother. She found my aunt, and the whole family gathered around. And he got 18 stitches over a little bit of water. But I learned at a young age, you don't get in water fights unless you know how to win it. And Willard didn't win that one. And George never spoke to Willard in the next 20 years. He talked through other people, either Jody or I or whoever the hired man was. 
but there was bad blood there, and he shared uh, a lot of the uh, uh, forest land with us. He had 60 head of cows that he had put on with our cows when we went to the forest. But they sure didn't talk. This is George's barn at the Kless place. This is Canyon Creek, just above George's uh, house, and very special creek. The Nez Perce, some of them escaped up that creek and set a fire to burn back to stop the soldiers from chasing them in 1877. But what George showed me, and I was always friends with George, he took me up there and showed me three big wheels of calcite. And this is some of the calcite here, big crystals, uh, and I've gone back to it four or five times, showed my son. But uh, calcite is a rarity, but it's in the limestone. And uh, something special. And then it, near the top, and I haven't been there, but my friend who's here today, Doug Riekert, found some sheep eater Indian teepees. And Doug was kind of like a mountain goat. He used to climb over these mountains and try to talk me into racing him when he walked and I rode a horse to get to destinations. And it was always a challenge. But we hunted together and he'd come down and fix our vehicles and we taught school together. And Doug, I'm glad you're here today. This is going up, this is the forest boundary. And Chalk Mountain is the center limestone with Trout Peak in the background. And uh, this is where we would wean the calves in the fall when they came out of Robber's Roost and down into the valley. And they'd get here and they were stopped by a fence. And we'd separate the uh, calves from the mothers and truck them down to the ranch. And we weighed them all. And uh, then buyers would come out a month later and we'd harden the calves up and they were on good feed. And we'd sell them and we got some of the best prices ever doing that. This is the Horton place and this is all that's left of the Horton homestead. And uh, this is a garage and George uh, Kless owned the Horton place also and kept a tractor in there. Chalk Mountain again. This is getting up on Logan Mountain, west of Rattlesnake, where we had both BLM and forest permits. And those are two of the workhorses that were getting fat because we no longer use them to pull wagons or hay rakes or mowing machines. Uh, one of my dad's photos. Another one of my dad's photos on Logan Mountain looking down on Black Mountain. This is looking over Jim Mountain off the uh, open meadows on top of Logan. This is looking back in Robber's Roost. And Robber's Roost, this is Trout Peak up here. This is Robber's Roost Creek here. This is called Long Ridge. And Robber's Roost is here. Fly Creek, Sheephead Creek. And we had that whole area that we put cows and bulls in. And when I was 12, I was put in a cow camp and told to keep the bulls spread out in that whole area and take salt in. And I was there from the 1st of July uh, at cow camp and in this country uh, till the 1st of September. And they brought food up and left it at the cow camp, but I didn't talk to another soul unless it was somebody in the back country. Uh, but I sure talked a lot to my horse and my dog. Uh, but it was when I learned to cook, and uh, it was a good summer. This is one of Bob Modell's uh, top hands, that, uh, and this is the Demoriac cabin in Robber's Roost that used to, it's in the forest, but uh, M.P. Demoriac uh, 
built this cabin, called it a cow camp, but it was a cabin that he took his guests to uh, from his ranch visitors from back east. But we went up and spent 10 days, my son and I and one other friend, and we put a new roof on it and stayed in the cabin. And uh, this kind gentleman took uh, our backpacks. We walked in and walked back out, but he came and got our uh, gear and packed it out on a horse. Uh, right within 500 yards is the old robber's roost cabin and people sign the inside of the old cabin. It's pretty well disintegrated, but lots of good memories. This is the sign in front of the uh, ranch and going into the ranch with the moon crest. And uh, again, Bob has always allowed me to go up, photograph, look, see what's going on. Uh, this was a trailer that I spent uh, a couple of summers in helping put up hay when I was in high school with my cow dog and my Jeep. I bought the Jeep when I was 13 years old and uh, was driving it back and forth to school. And Frank Blackburn, our sheriff, always played bridge with granddad and my grandmother at Logan Creek where granddad had retired. And he looked over his glasses at me. He says, Bobby, go down and get your driver's license tomorrow and tell them you were born in 1933. So I did. And I got a driver's license. I still have it. And then several years later, I went back and got a chauffeur's license. And I have that too. But uh, I was always interested uh, but Frank also taught me to swim at Damaris Hot Springs at 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, anyway, this is an old photograph when Frost and Richard hunted out of the Mooncrest Ranch. And uh, this building, Anna Moon was building as a cabin and she was building other cabins here. But these are Frost and Richard horses and they were camped uh, back up by a spring here on the left. There were two springs here. One on this side that was very hard water and then the one over on the volcanic side was very soft water. And today Bob has a choice of soft water or hard water uh, at his ranch on uh, the upper moon crest. This is a Fun photograph, I'd taken my Uncle Ned hunting up on the side, and these are the Palisades. This is Jess Frost, this is Max's dad, and my Uncle Dick Hughes that was the only brother to all the sisters that married the Frost and Richard. We had all four wheels uh, chained up, but he got himself, Ned did, with one shot, a nice bull elk, and he was uh, in his late 70s at that time. But what a treat to watch this old guide, outfitter, and photographer step out and shoot offhand and the front end of his rifle's going around like this, bang, and he broke the neck. Uh, great memory for me. This is looking up the upper Mooncrest Ranch. Bob Modell built the Mooncrest Lodge after he bought all the valley back. And uh, it's there for weddings, for guests, for hunters. And it is a special place. Uh, here's a sign inside the lodge. Beautifully put together. Uh, this is the fireplace. He had a small bar there, or does have. You'll notice the sign above the bar. A nice big kitchen, and he uh, can put out a lot of food there. This is a cabin for guests that was moved from the Kless place up there and is for guests today. 
I like this sign. I thought that was very appropriate. And I turned around and here comes a team of horses and some hay uh, down to feed some of their livestock. And of course they've got a red healer and the two men and they were happy as clams driving a horse. And I thought, that's a lot of work to have to harness them when you can throw it in the back of a pickup. And, but they were living the dream. This is the Palisades. Jody and I called them the seven white elephants. There's the elephant in the center. Do you see his trunk and what have you? And uh, uh, we still call it the seven white elephants. But when we're putting hay up there, uh, we enjoy looking at that. Bob, this is some of Bob's horses and mules. This one came over and my wife would feed anything and touch any mean dog or anything else in a parking lot. And they never bit her. But I said, you know, don't do that. And she never listened to me, even when I was a park ranger. Uh, oh yeah, she was feeding bears. They have wild turkeys up there. Elk, year round. This is the biggest ram uh, or mountain sheep that I've seen in a lot of years. And there's a lot of mountain sheep up there. I mean, it is a very special place. These rams I photographed going further up the North Fork and they migrate every year from the Wapata Ranger Station up to uh, Sylvan Pass. There's usually seven of them. And in the spring in June, you can't miss them because there's always cars stopped going up Sylvan Pass to look at them. Uh, this year we had one buffalo that stayed between Pahaska and Absorka, and uh, he never did go back to the park. Bachelor bull. This moose was up there three weeks ago, and it's the first bull moose I've seen in 30 years up there. And he traveled from the Palisades, and a week and a half later, I got a call that he was seen at the Stampede Grounds in town, and he was traveling and probably headed to the Bighorns. And of course, lots and lots of mule deer. And grizzly bears abound. Uh, mothers and their cubs. This is Porky Pine Needle and Draw. And right up here, there's a spring, and Porky Pine Needle and was a man's name, and he had a still. And it caught fire and burned up the side of Rattlesnake Mountain. The scars healed today, but it's still there. There's a memorial to the Rhodes Ranch at the east end of uh, Rattlesnake Mountain that you can see from the road. And uh, Willard put that before he passed away. And... Uh, Canyon Lake Estates is located in that same area. And thank you for watching. Uh, I've talked too long, but we have a few minutes for questions, and I'd be happy to answer them. Test, test. Eric's going to bring you the mic. Anybody have questions? Did I put you to sleep? Don't be shy. No questions? Yes. And now I see a photo of Andy Martin. Why did they name the hill Andy Martin Hill? Andy Martin had property in what's now the Buffalo Bill Reservoir. And he moved up South Fork. And what the... Uh, Bear Creek Ranch is today, owned by Hoodoo, was the Andy Martin Ranch. And that was the hill going up South Fork. 
Uh, and that was the second road that went in. The original road went down along the lake and came around by his ranch before the hill was put in. You're welcome. Uh, please uh, speak the questions into the mic because we're recording this for posterity. Thank you. Hey, Bob, what's the original story on the robber's roost cabin up there? Robber's roost cabin was uh, on a Forest Service trail coming from uh, the top of Dead Indian Meadows, and there was another Forest Service cabin there. And uh, it was used by the Forest Service and, and the people that uh, needed a cow camp. I have photographs of Ned Frost and Shorty Kelly and others. But on the inside, everybody signed their name. And somewhere in my files, I have all the names of the people that slept in the Robber's Roost cabin. And the reason it was called that is it's on Robber's Roost Creek. And it's right next to the Demoriac cabin within 500 yards or so. Does that answer your question? Anyone else? I hope this has been informative. Yes. Bob, the bear there that you took a picture of, was that the 104 bear? Uh, the one that's on the front of my book, yes. Okay. Hey, Bob, uh, what years do you think that Curly in Alberta had the, the old uh, Curly bought that in... Uh, uh, sometime in the 60s, because when I got there in 1969, Curly was going to town and getting drunk in the wintertime, and I was going up and breaking the ice for the cows and feeding them for a week at a time. And Alberta was usually with him, trying to get him back to the ranch. And uh, uh, Curly was quite a cowboy, but he was also quite a drinker. And then he sold everything out, and he moved up to Alaska and had a, a charter boat company for a while. And I don't know what happened to Alberta. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Somebody here had a question. Yes, that, that is uh, a cabin on Willard's homestead, the last homestead. And I didn't put in the map of all the homesteads on the creek. He homesteaded that in 1937. And Elaine and Jody were involved in Girl Scouts. And uh, Willard built it, and it was full of pack rats. And the girls asked to go up and camp there, and then they asked if they could have it. So the girls had it for probably seven, eight years. And Willard said, that's it. I want it back. And that's what happened to it. And it still sits up there. Great place to hunt deer. Oh, yes. Well, a few, anyway. Yeah. Yes. Yes, there was the Gen uh, the Martins and the Jensens, and uh, I did not bring my maps with, but I have the dates of when they homesteaded, and if you're interested, give me a call and I'd be happy to share it with you. Could you tell us a little bit about the Skytel Airport, who built it, what flew in and out of there, and... Uh, the history of that. Okay, Skytel is the Frost and Richard Ranch, and they had the big house there. And Cecil Leg, Jim Legg's son, bought it and incorporated it. And he built a runway when he came back from Iran. He and his wife were married and came, they were on some sort of work deal in Iran, and they came back and he built the runway there. Uh, across from uh, 
where the uh, gas station is in a little bit. You can tell because there are bigger pine trees where the runway was. I've landed there several times. Uh, he was going to make it into a motel system. Never got there. Uh, and it was used for probably 15 years. Uh, once in a while, somebody got short of gas and they would land there. Uh, and people coming back from the park that couldn't get through the pass because their plane wasn't full of enough horsepower to get them over the pass, and they would land the first place they saw to learn what was wrong with their airplane. Uh, but it, Cecil had a great thought. It just didn't fly for him. Does that answer your question? You bet. Okay, so all these family pictures that we have. I'm the youngest cousin. He's the eldest. <laughs> you didn't have to say that. Well, you are my elder. I esteem you. Janet, there are a lot of go ahead. A lot of pictures of you, much younger than the years that you've been talking about with the Rhodes family, um, and you, it looked to me like you were spending extended times at the ranch. I've never asked you about this at the Frost and Richard Ranch. Did you hang out there with your grandparents quite a lot? You well, were young. I hung out at three places as a young man. My dad was overseas in World War II. My mother was running the Cody Enterprise. And so I had three places to go. The Frost Ranch with Uncle Ned and Aunt Mary, Chu was, and the boys were all in the Army, gone. Or I could go to my granddad's retirement home, or I could go to Willard, Ro Willard Rhodes, and I spent most of my time there growing up. I went to the Wapita School. Uh, part of the problem was when Dad went to work for E.V. Robertson in D.C. as a senator, they took me back there, and they put me in Episcopal School for Boys, and they made me wear knickers. And the Secret Service picked me up, every day and took me to the school and then would pick me up on the way back. Well, I took a bag and I left my Levi's, my flannel shirt, and my cowboy boots behind the bushes at the school. And after two weeks, because I changed as soon as I got to the school, because I wasn't going to be a little Lord Flauntroy. And the father called dad and said, you've got to get him a uniform. And dad said, well, I saw him leave this morning in the uniform. So who comes and picks me up? Not Secret Service. My dad. And I was in this uniform. So he marched me in to see the father. And I ended up going home and getting paddled and a big argument between mother and dad. And I said, I'm never going back to that school. And another argument ensued the next day. They put me on a plane, and I flew to Billings by myself, and Granddad went up and picked me up. And then I lived at Willard and Elaine's and my granddad's for the next several years through 1947. Uh, but I was an independent little cuss, upset my mother a lot. But I lived where I could get the best meals, and Aunt Mary made great food. Elaine always had great food. My grandmother couldn't cook. She'd always had a cook. So Granddad was a great cook. And I worked at whatever we did. We used the crosscut saws to cut firewood. H have I answered your question? Okay. Janet, I could tell a story about you and Mac if you'd like. We'll save it for another time. Any other questions? We've run over time. Uh, if you want a book signed by me, they have all the books up there. Uh, please stop by, or if you want to visit, I'll be up uh, by the store. And uh, thank you so much for coming today.